Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blyton. This is Patch In, the show from SoundNotion.tv dedicated to the wonderful world of electroacoustic music. Let's start with some news and information. Akai's IMPC Pro is out for your iPad. If you've been looking for a drum machine, and I know I have, then this is probably the one to get. Features a bunch of really cool features, but the coolest one that I've seen in their videos is the turbo ducking uh, so that you can get New York style compression with even more compression uh, all automatically configured and you just crank the knob. It looks awesome. I'm probably going to buy it after we're done taping. <laughs> Speaking of iPads, uh, if, if, you, if you love all the features in, in the new iPad apps and everything, uh, but you get kind of frustrated with the physical interface of just having this blank screen to touch, and you love like the uh, knobs and different things to tweak of old analog synths, there's a new Kickstarter it's called Tuna Knobs. Uh, Samuel Verberg is the primary guy, and it's uh, from the Netherlands, and you should check it out. It's a, it's a really interesting thing. You, they've got little stick-on knobs that you can put in the place of the, uh, the software interface that happens on the iPad screen. And, yeah, they've, they've already reached their goal, but they've got 27 days to go, so you can order uh, all of your stuff. And it seems like the, they're going to go into production immediately after, and then you could get your stuff as early as November, which would be pretty neat. But these things look pretty amazing, and uh, there's a, a wide variety of apps, like Touch OSC, different Korg apps, and Touch a Ableton, that it's guaranteed to work for. They build those uh, supported apps, and they're adding to that list. So this is a, a really cool thing. Check out Tuna Knobs on Kickstarter. Okay, speaking of things that are really, really cool and hardware-y, uh, Moog Music has created the Werkstatt 01. Uh, this is a build-your-own synthesizer kit for a mono synth. This came out at uh, Moog Fest 14, and due to the incredible demand of everyone who was not able to attend that particular workshop, they've created it and they're marketing it. Um, I got a call about this from uh, one of my uh, contacts who works down at Sweetwater. He is incredibly excited with it. Apparently, everyone who has played it is enthralled with this. The videos are amazing. And if I had the cash, I would already have ordered one. So check it out. Sweetwater has a couple, but they are going fast. And I know I'm getting paid in a couple days, and that's exactly when I'm going to pre-order one of these for myself because these look awesome. Yeah. So Speaking of good, awesome things, uh, back to the land of software, Ableton has a new maintenance update for, out for live. It's 9.1.3. And uh, I wasn't able to find too much information about it, but those Ableton users out there, you can hopefully have a couple little bugs fixed. Yep, I've already downloaded that and installed it. Uh, it's just a maintenance update, nothing special. But if you want something special, uh, a new company that I've never heard of before called American Keyworks has released the Thorium Bowman. Uh, this is a keyboard that you can bow. It's basically, uh, it takes an electric guitar pickup and string and has the standard piano keys that press down against a fretboard to fret it. And you can play it just like that, or you can take a bow and it's got a little angle and you can bow it. So I suppose this would be as close to an electric hurdy-gurdy as you're ever going to get. And I want one. I want one badly. <laughs> They've got some really cool videos out about it. Um, they've got two different models. One is kind of like mid-range of a guitar, and the other is like the low end of a bass guitar kind of range. Um, they sound pretty interesting. I particularly like the, the kind of lead instrument one. They're, the model is AK-24. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice kind of axe thing. Um, and this is coming from... They used to, or the previous model was the AK-34, which was like, had a wider range. These ones are just two octaves, for better or worse. Um, and you can get one for as little as about 600 bucks. So it's, it's a pretty neat thing if you want to get into a really different kind of acoustic electric instrument. Right. Yeah. yeah, so check, check it out. And the cool thing is they come in both finished and unfinished wood versions. So you could have them pre-varnish it for you. Or do it yourself, or maybe get the unfinished version and go decoupage. Do whatever you want. They look cool. So speaking of wood and electronics, we've got a wonderful guest this month, Nathaniel Bartlett, 
amazing computer genius and marimba, marimba and otherwise percussionist. Uh, welcome to the show, Nathaniel. Thank you. It's good to be here. So I... Uh, as we were kind of talking before the show, I've I've been interested in your work for a long time. You you work with marimbas. You have custom computer, custom software, everything. Even like as we were getting going on this, you're you're coming to us on a Linux machine. I I, I don't know if we've had a guest before <laughs> that wasn't Windows or PC or Windows oh, yeah. or Mac. Um, uh, everything I do uh, is on on Linux, and it's it's kind of funny. It's not really coming from a. a a real ideological perspective initially. Um, I mean, it kind of is now, but when I got started, it was back when I was an undergrad, and that's what um, people were using in the in the advanced computer music lab. So I got into it because that's that's what I, I learned. That's what why I was my first step. It's wonderful. Yeah, I, I it, in my undergrad, I think Ben was the guy who got me into Linux because I, yeah. I was I was getting into pure data for the first time, and he got me yep. started on a. Ubuntu Studio distribution. It was, it was a pretty nice thing. Um, right. And even before that, I was uh, starting off um, at the recommendation of Mark Sullivan on uh, Fedora Core with uh, the Karma Labs plugins, yeah. which are that's right, that's amazing. Exactly. I, I have used the, um, I use the Karma, I use the Ubuntu Studio. Yeah, so I mean, it's very similar to, to my trajectory. Yeah. Cool. Which that was my first question for you is which version of Linux are you using? <laughs> right now I'm using um, uh, like on my my audio computer I'm using uh, Ubuntu 12.04. It's like the long term support long-term. which I like to use because uh, I got so many other things to do I can't be updating my OS every uh, every six months. Right. Yeah. And I found like I always want to use these kind of obscure double head passively cooled graphics card and it's just it can be such a nightmare <laughs> to get them to uh to work that like once I get a working machine, like I really don't want to touch it for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um it. are you describing my Linux box right now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have the exact same thing. Um I've got my Linux box, uh it has the two passively cooled double headed uh NVIDIA video cards in mm-hmm. it. Uh, yes. Which were a pain to get configured, but once yes. they are, they're amazing. Yep, so, absolutely. Yeah. Well, before we get too far down the Linux rabbit hole, uh, so Nathaniel, you're a, you're a marimba player. You do all the all the everything with computers. It sounds like, and you're a composer all, and recording engineer, all the things. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got into this path that what you do? Yeah. Um, so I mean, it started with percussion. Um, and I was kind of doing all percussion and, you know, my undergraduate degree was in percussion performance, but then, you know, I kind of realized that, um, for me personally, uh, I don't like spreading myself, you know, too thin. I do like to be able to do something at whatever my maximum capacity to do that thing is. And so kind of my, my deepest love in percussion was the marimba. And so I started to kind of focus in on that in the hopes that I could really optimize my potential on that instrument. But I always really loved the rest of percussion. Um, not so much, you know, the, the, not because of the playing, but because of the, the sound world that mm-hmm. you had access to. And at, at that time, I was also getting really interested into high fidelity recordings and playback systems. And so kind of my, the marriage of uh, my pursuit of you know, marimba as a solo instrument, um, my love of the kind of vast and raw and elemental sound world of percussion, plus the hi-fi aspect, I realized kind of like I could have through computers and electronics, I could, I could um, specialize in marimba as my live interface, but have access to the rest of that sound world that I loved via electronics. And yeah. that's when I started down, down that road. And and by hi-fi, I, I've seen on your website you're you're talking like 24-bit, 88.2 kilohertz. Yeah, yeah, like, and and, um, and of course, not only so there, that's the source material, but then not only is it surround, um, but if you think about um, like whatever, maybe it's 5.1 channel surround or 7.1 channel surround. It doesn't matter how many loudspeakers you add in a circle around the listener at about ear height. 
um, you're still missing an entire spatial dimension. And when there's only three spatial dimensions and you care about spatial audio, that's kind of a big deal. So, yeah. mm-hmm. so my, my big thing was always going to true 3D audio. And it's funny, mm-hmm. you will hear people refer to 5.1 or 7.1 as, as 3D audio, but it's, it's not. It's missing the height. And so my first hi-fi setup was actually um, uh, Magnapan 1.6 loudspeakers and you can find a picture of those on the website but they are these massive they're about five and a half feet tall wow. and they don't use speaker cones they use uh, quasi ribbon technology so they're kind of like this this moving plane of of mylar and what what they do they're not designed to look all futuristic and like you know two monoliths from 2001 although they do they they um, give the real affect of of height, so okay. when you listen to a symphony or anything, you get you get such a implied three dimensionality that that blew my mind. I was really and I realized that if that was how good an implied three dimensional soundscape could sound, what would a true three dimensional soundscape sound like? And that, yeah. that was right. kind of the seed. Yeah, those of us or those viewers of ours that can see the video version, uh, your profile picture on Skype seems to be a picture of when you're like your performance setup, where there's four different stacks of speakers, one and each stack has one at the base and one looks like about twelve feet up or something like that. Yeah, you, exactly. And in live performance, um, those loudspeakers are further apart, and the audience is in the middle. But it's just yeah. so hard to capture my whole setup in one photograph that for the purposes of those photographs on my website, like I, I, I think I, things are at about a, you know, 25, uh, by 25 by 12, um, kind of cuboid setup. So, so I could capture it in one, um, one photograph without an insane wide angle lens, which would yeah, yeah. look weird. I, I think it's a, yeah. it's a, it's an incredible thing. And I, I haven't been fortunate enough to get to see one of your performances, but it must, it must be an interesting thing. Like, how do you, how do you go about, I mean, so not only are you working with <laughs> like audio, but there's at least eight different audio signals coming out to the audience than one to go yep. to each of the speakers, I imagine. Yeah. Like, yeah. How, how do you work on that? Do you, do you have a, <laughs> like a space set up? I, I, I remember reading about a, a certain kind of studio that you have. Yeah, so I, um, I'm actually, the reason I'm in Albuquerque right now is my wife and I, well, and, and young son, are about to move to Albuquerque. Um, and so Soundspace Audio Lab, my studio, is now going to be out in the high desert, um, oh. looking over a, the foothills and up to a mountain. It's, it's going to be stunning. It's a great place to make strange music. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyways, you know, prior to that, I always had a um, smaller kind of like control room, which uh, for normal people would be their dining room or something. Yeah. Uh, and I had my cube loudspeaker set up and all my computers in a much like, a, like an 8x8x8 eight by eight by eight cube. Mm-hmm. And I had a little listening platform with a single chair, so my, my head was exactly in the middle of that cube. And then I had a sound isolated and controlled room that I would do my acoustic recording in. And I built all the stuff I built myself, all the loudspeaker mounts and all the studio um, sound treatment, all the road cases. A lot of times I found I've had more time than money. And so it's vastly more uh, cost effective for me to build my own stuff. Yeah, that makes a lot yeah. of sense with the computer approach too, doing yeah. Linux, right. being free and, and everything. I, I yeah, understand. Plus not using Mac hardware, um, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I think on the other on our other show we talked about Hackintosh a little bit. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. still a thing, but um, yeah, that could Very be another much still a thing. Yeah, yes. okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, and that kind of brings me yeah. uh, to a question: uh, You're building all of these uh, hardware uh, mounts, but mm-hmm. um, how are you? doing the software you're building a lot of that yourself as well so what is your uh preferred software platform to use are you coding everything in super collider or max or c or what well almost all my all my real-time audio stuff i do in pd sweet all my um audio recording i do in ardour oh yeah 
and all my real-time notate. Well, I used to do my real-time notation stuff in Gem, wow. but then I got more ambitious, and now I'm doing all my real-time notation stuff in uh, C++ uh, with the aid of the Open Frameworks platform. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's quite an endeavor. I uh, I've been digging into Gem a little bit more mm -hmm. myself lately, and I. Uh, that must have been quite a quite a thing to take on just to do that and uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Can you talk Gem about that process a little bit absolutely Jim worked very well for what I was doing but then I got involved in doing um, some motion capture um, interfaces using multiple connect cameras yeah mm -hmm. and I realized that while I could use them in Jim I just couldn't do exactly what I needed to do and I had to go to the next level and so I just took the next couple of months and taught myself enough C++ um, to make to make things work the way I wanted to work I mean it's it's insanely hacky yeah it's embarrassing like whenever there's like a real engineer has the opportunity to, to, to look at what I'm doing it's it's always like I can I avoid that like the plague because of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm an artist, and I, I only need to do things enough so they so the end result. I found that the engineers, and it's you know actually very good from merit perspective. They they um, it's almost like they don't care about the end result. They care about the uh, the quality of the code, and uh, you know I'm the I'm the opposite. But um, yeah, I mean, things work, especially as composer musicians. Sometimes we've got deadlines and we don't necessarily right. want to completely live yeah. in coding land for I, I very much realize I have a you know I have a limited limited time on earth and uh, <laughs> you know you can't you can't do everything so you 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 make you have your priorities for example um, my real-time notation interfaces uh, you know sometimes I'll just have like a straight up like red square light up red or light up green you know it's not like this drop shadow lickable Mac interface with like do drops on it and stuff like you know stuff like that it's like because that doesn't add any additional musical functionality for for me and it's only designed right. for me to use so I can save a lot of time making these things look uh, they ju I just let them look really raw and everything and it works for me nice I'm glad I'm not the only one who codes uh, less than attractive user interfaces then yeah <laughs> I yeah. suppose um, I mean, of course, part of that is always a function of PD. Yeah. Uh, but the real question then is how uh, does your audience perceive what you're doing when you have the marimba in front and then you have the full spatialization like in a piece like uh, Time, Space, Place? Mm -hmm. I, mean, uh, I feel that a lot of audiences nowadays are conditioned by cell phones and iPads and the limits of whatever their personal tech budget is to expect stereo. So how do they react when you put them inside of a three-dimensional piece? Well, I, um, let me, let me think exactly. Uh, I, I find that, you know, there's a lot of people that really appreciate it. You know, the people, fortunately, that, that appreciate it come up and talk to me after the, after the shows, you know, because they're, they're relatively small shows, and, and so it's very um, accessible for me to go talk to the audience and, and vice versa. You know, no one generally comes up and tell, tells me how awful it was, fortunately. <laughs> Most people are, are more polite than that. But, but a fair number of people come up and they comment about the spatial um, aspect uh, as very much increasing the kind of visceral engagement with the music because it takes this music from this abstract thing that kind of happens in your ear to this uh, physical thing that has, has has physical structure or, you know, kind of a virtual physical structure. So you almost feel like you can reach out and touch it. So it's almost like it's become corporeal. Yeah, and yeah. then, um, so there's that. And it kind of increases their engagement with discrete elements. Like, for example, if you, if I were to do something as simple as record a four-part fugue and spatialize each voice of the fugue in at you know north south west and east your 
your brain can kind of like untangle that counterpoint in a vastly superior way, even though audio-wise nothing is different. That's what mm -hmm. is so interesting about the, the spatial um, aspect is that it's using. Uh, it's like if you if you were to walk around your house and cover one of your eyes for a, for two minutes and then and then take off your hand and then you're now you're seeing in stereo now you're seeing depth and everything becomes more you get just this flood of extra information about the world around you that's what it's like to listen to my setup okay mm -hmm. have you found that like compositionally do you end up addressing different kinds of ideas giving this extra dimension of depth absolutely um because as human like the pieces are meant to be listened to in a particular orientation with the listener, you know, all the listeners facing a particular direction. So humans have a particular response to like up versus down, not so much left versus right. Although I've heard like different neurologists talk about things like that, but like definitely up, down and front back. Yeah. Um, humans have a real like inherent uh, concept of, because obviously our, our, eyes are in the front, so something that's happening behind us has a, has a unique feel to it. Um, yeah, so absolutely, I feel like um, spatially I do different things in music, in addition to the fact that the combination of the high definition plus the spatial allows me to make very, very dense soundscapes that are audibly, audibly clear that if I did like lo-fi mono, it would just be a mess. And yeah, yeah. Just, just one thing to add, which is that the high definition aspect isn't just about making a recorded cello sound like a, a real cello. But what a lot of people don't, don't realize is that the higher quality the loudspeakers and the source material, even if it's stereo, like if you listen to a, a lousy stereo, you just hear sounds coming from each loudspeaker. You listen to a fantastic stereo and every sound, like if it's a recording of an orchestra, is coming from a precise virtual space between the loudspeakers. So the high definition aspect actually dramatically increases the clarity of the spatial aspect. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we're actually going to talk a little bit about as well uh, during our two-minute challenge. Um, but you're recording everything and you're playing back stuff that is so high def um, is another thing that I don't think a lot of people are used to nowadays anymore since everything is MP3 and thus highly compressed. So have you uh, seen that lead into any type of issues with how people perceive the sounds, that they're too crisp or they're too uh, clear than what they would otherwise be exposed to? Um, well, well, it's kind of interesting, like not at my concerts in the sense that I'm able to present things in a way that works. I do, I do wonder, though, if someone were to listen to my recording um, like, for example, uh, the compression, you know, there's two sides to the compression coin. There's the, there's the data compression of the MP3, and then, right. there's the di then, then of course, there's the dynamic compression. Right. And my works use neither. So when you listen to a piece like uh, my Starbirth, well, any of my pieces, but particularly Starbirth, you have to turn, and you're, if you're listening on, like, a, a home hi-fi, you have to turn the volume up, you know, like, 25 degrees further than what you would do if you were listening to a commercial pop recording. Because yeah. the lowest, the quietest sounds are so much more quiet. So um, I, do, I do worry about that a little bit to the extent that I've even thought about creating like a, um, uh, like my recordings all come in four versions. There's the mm -hmm. high def eight channel, high def four channel, high def, high def stereo and CD quality stereo. And then maybe I thought about creating a fifth version, which is like, I would call like, you know, automotive or something. And it'd be like <laughs> dynamically nice. compressed stereo version. So you could listen to it in your car or something. But, or the, the, yeah, the version to listen to a washing dishes or something. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> um, but but uh, I find that the kind of people that come to my shows, they, they generally appreciate it. And some people really appreciate it. And some people get back to me after the fact and um because i have the same experience like i'm working in my studio for a bunch of hours and i jump in the car to go to the grocery store and i turn on the radio and it's just nuts it's like <laughs> this 
this this hyper because I've been working with un, these uncompressed high def sounds, and then it's just right. like everything sounds the same, and it's just flat, and it's just right up in your face. And yeah. so people hear my stuff, and they actually sometimes have more of a reaction to it when they go back versus when they encounter it in the first place. Yes, okay. subtlety. Yeah, what yeah. a concept. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you do you find yourself as a musician ever like? I mean, I know uh, different medium or different ideas might work better in different kind of medium and everything. Do you do you find yourself uh, in the pieces that you're doing ever come across an idea that you think might work better in in that like just the ideas are right in your face all all together at the same time? Do you, do you ever address things like that or? Absolutely. Like um, I use compression and things like that in my music, but just not as like on the master bus where like yeah, everything right, gets compressed. Right. So I might, I might create some sounds in the context of the piece that are, that are incredibly aggressive and compressed and stuff like that, or, um, distorted. For example, um, my piece Trichotomic Ecology starts with these, uh, all these tam tam recordings of a tam tam being scraped, mm -hmm. but it's kind of low, fi it's spatialized, but it's kind of like low fied up. So okay. you have these kind of grainy digital sounds, and of course I wouldn't want the whole piece to sound grainy and digital, but I use those for effect um, because that's kind of like the, the prelude to the piece. And then when the viola comes in and it's a you know pristine acoustic recording of the viola, it's just so complex and unbelievable that it emphasizes that nature of the viola. Mm -hmm. Well, as a viola player myself, I can say that obviously it's going to be the most rich sound possible in the recording, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more, you know, after I, I have this fantastic, um, viola player, Niels Baltman that I've worked with a number of times and he's just, he's just stunning and he's fantastic in, in every possible way. And working with him so much, I'm kind of like, yeah, the violin, I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> It's oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. Ben's a violinist. Token violinist here. It kinda, it, it's kind of like, I kind of feel like it's like the the flute is the viola and the violin is the piccolo. It's almost like two, oh, I've gotten snap. so used to, I've gotten so used to Niels's This is like bizarro stuff, like, music nerd talk. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Backwards. Yeah. Right. We started talking about what kind of build of linux we have and then we're going into violin viola it's awesome well and and then and then you've got two viola fans and one violin fan like that's yeah. so backwards i'm actually <laughs> writing a piece for viola right now too well oh nice traitor <laughs> it's also got a violin part but okay uh, yeah, yeah. I, the way i feel about i think viola and marimba really go well together because i think um yeah I, I i i look as look at viola and double bass um, as kind of the, the oversized instruments of yeah. the string family, in that I feel like with viola, you hear the wooden structure of the instrument. Uh, much and, and with the uh, violin, it's much more the strings. And of course, I love the violin. I'm, I'm being kind of like yeah, cheeky yeah. about it. Um, but well, violinists are famously high strung anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I like about, about the, the viola and the, and the double bass. Um, in in the context of of my music, where I can capture the the fullness of that complexity. Yeah, I mean, so uh, the music that I've, of yours that I've listened to are uh, some of your your more recent pieces, like Clang and Time Space right. Place. Um, and it's really interesting to me the the like the depth of or the richness of sound that you get just in the recording of the marimba, but then also all the processing that happens with it. Could you talk about the, I guess, the audio landscape that you're approaching in a piece like Clang? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Clang, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that project. And I think it's very, um, it really illustrates one of my uh, main concepts, which is like better input, better output in the sense that if I'm manipulating an acoustic instrument, if I record that with phenomenal precision and I manipulate it, you know, with, with uh, very, very high definition software, what I get out um, confounds a lot of people's expectations about what electronics or computer generated sounds might sound like as something um, 
inferior to or not lack or not uh, contain the complexity of acoustic sounds. But I feel like when I have a great input and I manipulate it, it maintains that complexity or increases the complexity. So the way I think about it, it's like the, it's like um, it's like uh, making wine from grapes. You start with this complex natural thing that we can't synthesize and you manipulate it and you also end up with this phenomenal wonderful but different thing or the difference between like something purely computer generated or whatever being like tang and a manip manipulation of a natural sound being like you know orange juice with all its like complexity and variation having said that you can then use um the synthetic stuff to really really great effect for example in time space place i use all these um uh, pure sine waves yeah. that um, you know have a very unearthly sound because they're so pure. But then I use a very sophisticated. I um, treat them with a very sophisticated surround reverb algorithm. So it's kind of a combination where you have uh, these incredibly synthetic sounds, but then you put them in this natural environment, and 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 I like that a lot. Right um, on that subject, um, since. I've listened to that piece a couple of times now. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your choice of sine waves for the electronic mm -hmm. material there, since they have no harmonics, effectively. Right. Um, and yet they sound so natural in the reverb. Can you talk about the process of how you uh, produce that effect? And yeah. What, how you were doing the reverb? Uh, is that a plug-in, or did you code that yourself? Or The, the reverb, um, I, I'm kind of on the, on, the, on the fence about talking what's like... Uh, about what specific commercial um, hardware I use in the sense that I feel like if they want me to yeah. talk about it, they can pay me, you know? <laughs> but, Send checks yeah, to uh, soundnotion.tv. So. And like, because, you know, Malatech, the, the company um, I, that I the, made the Merma that I play, they're very mm -hmm. generous in how they support me. And um, I can talk a little bit about my computer if you're interested, but NPC Noise built that yeah. for me and they, and they were supportive of my work. So, I'll talk about them, but, you know, anyway, so I have a, a very, very high, well, I would maybe call the highest end, true high-definition surround reverb hardware unit. Um, cool. And the reason I use the hardware unit is because I use it live in performance, and so it's yeah. zero limits. And uh, so that's really important, and it doesn't take a massive amount of CPU out of my computer. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's an interesting choice of when to go with hardware over software, especially yeah, exactly. like when you've got a computer right there, too. That's, that's yep. interesting. Well, and is that um, a function of the fact that you're using PD, since that does tend to focus more of uh, its processing on the CPU? Or is that just a function of the hardware interface being more user-friendly and easier and more consistent? Um, well, I've just found that um, the... The having the hardware reverb is um, like because I you know I, I um, when I buy gear I try to think of like how many different ways can I use this, so mm -hmm. it's not that I couldn't use some software reverb in a certain context, but I can use the hardware in every context, including without a computer. Right. Right. You know, so if if ever I wanted to do um, live engineer someone else's performance and just go straight through an analog mixer and do everything analog, you know, I can do that. So. Um, but just getting back to the, the sine waves and everything, and as a, a, a tiny aside, um, one of the things I do with my setup is I use the surround. I don't really know anyone else doing this. I'm using my surround reverb processor live. So when I perform in, a, in like a, a hall and it's very dry and acoustically precise, I make it sound like a, a concert hall. And because the audience is in... Uh, side of my loudspeaker array, it's a true, it's a reverb as a spatial affect, as opposed to like if someone has a guitar amp that's a reverb amp, and that's kind of like reverb as timbre coming from a point source. But this yeah. is much more like a, a true concert hall reverb. So when I take those sine waves, um, the hardware reverb that I have is infinitely configurable. So I set it up so that uh, after I do like a little sine wave pulse, I would very much listen to how that sound bounced around the virtual room and what kind of um, harmonics and artifacts were contained in the reverb. And I chose it so that it was 
um, spatially and timbrally complex and, and interesting uh, based on those sine wave impulses. Yeah. I mean, so along these lines, I, where you're really giving the audience a specific spatial experience as if they're in this space through, through using this reverb, I, you mentioned your NPC noise and like, I know my, for myself, I've, I've done everything from bringing my old like HP tower on, on stage mm -hmm. in a bar or having my, my old MacBook fan furiously going as I'm trying <laughs> to do this like really quiet thing, but that was so processor intensive. I, I would have loved to have a, a really completely silent computer that was stable. <laughs> it sounds yeah. like you found something like that. I did. Um, and the, the short version is every single element in the computer is passively cooled and it has a solid state hard drive. There are literally oh. zero clean parts in yeah. my entire computer. Um, so the sides of my computer, um, and you can, on, probably not on my website anymore, but on my, on my Facebook page, you can definitely find some pictures of the, of the computer. It has two massive heat sinks on either side, so it looks like a power amp. And yeah. uh, all the all the heat generating components, there are um, like nickel plated copper heat pipes that go from like the graphics card or the CPU to those heat sinks. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, the, the computer I got from them is the most stunningly, flawlessly built computer. I mean, it is so physically rock solid and and beautiful and they do a burn in test and make sure like you can run it at like maximum capacity for, you know, 24 hours. So, wow. um, I've nice. been like, I've been super happy with it. Cool. Yeah. We, we don't normally just completely straight up plug, a, a product for somebody, but this seems like something I'm going to check out because yeah. yeah, I've, I've been due for a silent computer for a long time, but, uh, th this is really exciting. Uh, talking to you about all this and it's, it's lovely to talk all the technical things as well. Um, I was wondering, do you like, what you, you said you're moving studio. Is there any other music that you're working on right now, or what, what's what's up next for you? Yeah, I'm really really excited about. Um, I have a new um, composition for Merman Computer that I'll be recording in the next couple months, and I'll be taking it on tour in September, like late September and late October, and it. Um, I'm trying to think what I could say about it in a, in a nutshell, but it's just kind of a new version of all the, um, what I can do artistically with all the new software and stuff I've been, I've been creating. Uh, like a lot of my recent work, it's kind of a, um, what you might call an album length or evening length work. That's a format I've, I've really enjoyed, um, working in and, um, it'll, involve uh, some much more sophisticated uh, custom marimba computer interface. Uh, I've been working with, the, like I said, the Kinect the cameras, and uh, that's what I use to generate the, si well, not generate the sine waves themselves, but control the sine waves in time, space, place. I developed a um, mallet tracking system that can track all four of my mallets discreetly so I can kind of draw the sounds in front of me. Cool. And um, was, was that using open frameworks kind of yes. libraries as well? Cool. Yeah. And so this new piece is going to be using some of the things I've thought of. I thought of uh, at the time I was doing that. I just didn't get around to creating it. Um, so that album will be out in the next couple months. Uh, the the I the um, I'll move to the new place, get the studio set up, and, and hopefully be able to to get that uh, get that recording made. I also uh, have a piece for solo multiple percussion called Luminous Machine that I'm eager to get uh, recorded, and I'm working on an album that's going to have. Um, there's a couple of pieces from Marima Computer that other composers wrote for me, Alan Schindler and Stephen Dembski that I haven't got a chance to record yet, and I feel really bad about that, so I'm finally going to get around to that. So I've got a lot of projects coming up. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. I mean, so I, it, it's, it's really nice seeing artists kind of develop a, a specific 
interface or an idea for a long time, and, and it seems like you're really digging into this and trying different directions. How, how, have, you, how have you found uh, other composers? Like, are, is it interesting for you seeing what other composers do with your setup as they're writing pieces for you? Absolutely. Um, and it's, I particularly, um, you know, I work with composers. Uh, I like people that have um, a very distinct artistic personality. You know, it's kind of like, um, and for, for uh, performers too, what I like, even when I'm going to hear a symphony orchestra and I'm listening to the timpani player, I want to hear someone who's got ideas and a, and a unique approach. Um, because I don't know why you would do anything differently. I mean, you're a unique person. You, you should have a unique approach and bring something new to the table. So Alan Schindler you can kind of instantly recognize his compositions, and, I, and I, I love them. And then Stephen Dembski, you can instantly recognize his compositions, and they're completely different from Alan Schindler's compositions, and I, and I really like them too. And so uh, when I work on Salsa's work, and they have a unique approach, and it's different from my own, I feel that really broadens my horizons as both a performer and a composer. It's like um, if you're an athlete, you know, you do certain kinds of things to train yourself and playing certain other people's music, whether it's Schindler or Dembski or Bach or Eric Satie or whatever, um, is a way to broaden my technique as a performer. And, and um, uh, it uh, builds in me or uh, instigates in, in me new, new ideas for my own compositions, you know, not to imitate what they do, but it it uh, you know gets my creative mind going. Yeah, and I I imagine like writing things for other instruments or for other people to play might in, inform and affect your ideas as you're developing this hi-fi and 3D marimba experience as well. Are you do you have any other projects that you're working on like that or? Um, yeah, well I, I finished the Luminous Machine and I want to. Um, write some more acoustic music. The, the trick is like generally for the acoustic music, it's written for other people to perform. Mm -hmm. So, yep. um, I, I, I wait until I have someone that's interested in, in having me write a piece for them and play it and record it. Um, so that's a little bit more complex than my own work where I can just write it and then, and make it happen. Right. Um, so now that I'm moving to Albuquerque, I'm, I'm very eager to find some good players here that, that might be interested in, in my music. Um, I'm recording my music, so hopefully there will be some, some works in the future. And then the other project is if you, like in my piece, Trick Atomic Ecology, that I was talking about, it's not just marimba computer, it's, you know, it's marimba, viola, percussion, and computer. Mm. And uh, I didn't, never had a studio facility where we could record all three of those parts in isolation simultaneously. Yeah. So we recorded each of the parts individually. And right. what I want to do is with a couple additional hardware, you know, additional microphones, uh, microphone preamplifiers, um, and some musicians that were interested in my work and were available to do that stuff live and to tour that stuff live. So I would have, you know, three musicians that would be, you know, the marimba would be in front and then, you know, maybe a percussionist or whatever would be just a little bit to the left and uh, something, you know, something else, another percussionist or a viol player or whatever would be slightly over to the right Everybody would have their computer screens, you know, to view their real-time notation, yeah. um, and we would all do this music live. So, uh, so a piece like Trick Ecology, but live. So that's a that's a project that I hope I can accomplish sometime in the next couple of years. Indeed. Nice. Yeah, and hopefully all those screens would be attached to silent computers and, and be yeah. lovely. <laughs> Good well, I, I um, I'm really hoping. I don't know if this would work, but it seems like the kind of thing that like uh, even a short, you know, residency at a uh, university. Um, so instead of just having, uh, using the same players every time, I think it would be interesting to, you know, go to a place and work with some musicians I haven't worked with before for a couple of days and, and rehearse and talk about how the real-time notation works and then do a concert. So that's another thing that's been in the back of my mind too. Yeah, I would definitely, definitely get involved with that if you did one of those up in Michigan. 
Oh, I'd love yeah. to. So. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, I guess. Sorry. Go ahead, Nate. Along those lines, um, it's been an interesting thing to me. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. Uh, recording a marimba and miking a marimba is something that I, I can't think of somebody who might be more of an expert on it than you. <laughs> and uh, it, it, that's been a, a task for me uh, just in, in different projects, especially like, and that's why it sounds so interesting, the project with uh, like having these different kinds of instruments and having them isolated and, and mic'd so differently, I imagine. And that, you, so you, you must have been developing your technique and exactly how to get the sound of the marimba either onto a recording or into a live space. It, it, yeah, has that been interesting to develop over these years? Yeah, yeah, it has. And, um, uh, you know, obviously the, the demands of doing something live because of the possibility of feedback and right. other kinds of sound bleed issues is different than uh, recording a, somewhat where you have to make different compromises right. and you know recording is great because generally the way I do it I don't really have to make any compromises and in short the, the secret to um, recording a marimba is omnidirectional mics because of the mm -hmm. bass response. Okay. Um, like, because what people love about a five octave marimba is that, that enormous bass sound on the bass end. And as soon as you take a cardioid mic, for example, and you, by necessity, it has to be kind of far away from the marimba because if you put it really close and the marimba is nine feet long, you're only going to record a couple notes. Right, you know? right. So... Uh, like a lot of cardioid mics only have a flat frequency response at about 30 centimeters away from the sound source. So yeah. if you're recording a guitar, like if you move it really close, then you get a bass boost because of the proximity effect. But when you move it farther away, you lose the bass. And so omnidirectional mics have no um, proximity effect. You right, can move it right. as close or as far away as you want, and you still get that bass. So you can have the microphones, like let's say you're recording it in stereo, far enough that you get a proper stereo uh, recording of a nine-foot-long instrument, but you don't lose any of that bass. So that's that's kind of the, the recording approach to the marimba. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for that. I, I feel like I really learned something from this whole conversation, and specifically that. That's something I've been Great. curious about for a long time. Yeah. And, oh, and by the way, um, for some reason, like, I just find so many musicians don't, under, understand or they don't value or they don't use omnidirectional mics like yeah. in live i use omnidirectional mics live all the time and people are, people would immediately think oh well you know reverb i'm mean, not reverb um feedback problems feedback. right obviously of course, right. i'm not i'm not playing with like massive levels and if you yeah. get an omnidirectional mic like right up to someone's cello the difference between the direct sound from the cello and the ambient sound of whatever you you have a huge um you have a huge differential, so you can get away with using omnidirectional mics a lot of time in in live performance, and uh -huh. to great effect. And people don't don't think about it. In fact, I've used it. I've used like um, like a pressure zone mic, or otherwise yeah. known as a boundary layer mic, yeah. just standing on the floor in front of a flute player. To uh, so it was a solo flute piece, but I uh, fed the signal into my reverb generator so it sounded like the flute player was in a concert hall but I was using this omnidirectional mic and it gave a very 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 natural um, sound and there was no feedback problems you know I've got a couple old crown PZM mics boundary that's mics that's exactly like what that. I was using yeah Yeah, really? I, might, I, I might just try that that sounds amazing <laughs> yeah and if, if, um, if you're not doing something too loud like for example it was just to give subtle reverberation and um, also what I found is like the um, feedback characteristics of, of an omnidirectional mic are entirely different than the feedback characteristics of a cardioid mic. Like, you know, that high squealing you get when a card cardioid mic back. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I'm all too it, familiar it, with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's what you usually encounter with a 
omnidirectional used live is the you start to have this booming bass sound that goes and gets out of control. And so yeah. if you use a high pass filter, like for example, if you're using a flute, it doesn't have any low frequencies. You crank up that high pass filter and you can almost have do anything and you don't have feedback. That's amazing. Okay. And so in that way, omnidirectional mics for a lot of things are, are fantastic um, to use in live, live sound. Gosh, you just you just changed my live rig a little bit, which mm -hmm. I think is, is pretty exciting. Um, In fact, I um, the the tricky the tricky thing with with the bass thing is though, like if you're recording a really low bass instrument or even even marimba, which goes down to sixty four hertz, which is right. the, you know lowest fundamental. Yeah, you don't have a whole lot of room to roll off that that low end. But I did have right. the, the person that um, the company that built my microphone preamp is a is a very small company and they were willing to do a custom mod to me to, to make the roll off at the uh, high pass filter right at 60 hertz. So I take it up as far as I can uh, without interfering with that beautiful bass end of, of the marimba. And uh, I can use Omni mics and, and be, be pretty much okay. Nice. Wow. And yeah, thank you so much. So like, I know a magician doesn't necessarily tell their secrets, but yeah. it's, it's, it's such a privilege to, to get to know some of this information yeah. of how, how, how you do what you do. Um, and it's, it's been really great to hear you talk about the, the high fidelity kind of quality and the different things that we get, gain from using it, which also actually links, as, as Ben alluded to, it links to our last segment of the show. Um, yeah, Ben, how do, how do you feel about doing this month's edition of the two minute challenge. Oh, I, uh, I feel like I always do somewhat yeah. intimidated and, uh, hoping that I can squeak this in just under the buzzer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see about that. You ready for this? I am. Your so, clock. uh, so we ben, haven't told you... uh, people what I'm doing yet. Have we? Go yeah. For it. What are you going to talk about Ben? I'm going to explain what bit depth is. Ooh. And, we, and our, our guest this, this week or this month seems to be an expert, so we'll see how you do. Go for it. <laughs> hey, Mark, good set. Hit it. Okay, we've already talked about the sample rate, which is the number of samples uh, per second responsible for the frequency response of a digital sound when played back at that specific rate. What? But what is in each sample that you record? Simply put, each sample is a measure of the instantaneous amplitude at that point in time. This is stored as a bit, which is a binary number that's either a zero or one. However, by increasing the number of bits, you also increase the numbers uh, of numbers that it's possible to represent. And in fact, this follows a very simple formula of two to the power of n minus one, where n is the number of bits in your system. So if you have a one bit system, you can have one number. If you have two bits, you can have three numbers. If you have 16 bits, you can have 65,535 numbers. 24-bit uh, gives you over 16 million, and so on and so forth. This is important because the higher the bit depth you have, the higher the dynamic range you can have. So the difference between the quietest and the loudest point in your uh, recording or in your playback. This is due to the fact that an analog signal first is rounded off to the nearest digital value in a process known as quantization. Uh, naturally, this has the possibility and almost always introduces some sort of rounding errors, uh, particularly in lower bit depths called quantization noise. So while you're calculating this specific amount of noise in a particular situation is beyond the scope of this challenge, uh, I can tell you that having a larger bit depth results in a higher dynamic range and thus a higher signal to noise ratio, meaning that you get less noise coming through at that low volume and you have thus more dynamic contrast by having more bits. Uh, of course, if you want to add errors, you can always deliberately reduce the bit rate and get bit crushing, but that's another topic, as is dithering where you reduce the bit depth uh, without getting errors. You know, you would think, <laughs> you would think that, we, you know, we've gone through all this trouble to figure out the... Uh, the, the 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 timer thing with the with the patch and everything going live that that I would have some sound to go with that, <laughs> but you'd be wrong. Are you, are you a musician or something? What are you right? About? Yeah, right. Instead, I'm I'm forced to make the sounds with my mouth like a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> nice job, Ben. Yeah. Thank you. And Nathaniel, how do you think we did with bit depth this month? I think that's great. And if uh, you want another uh, another version of that, you could talk about DSD, Direct Stream Digital, <laughs> which uses one bit and an ultra high um, sampling rate, which is 64 times the speed of a CD sampling rate. Yeah. Um, and, and it's so there's other approaches to it. what's so interesting is like you go from zero to 99% of the truth about digital audio and it's all pretty clear and then you go from 99 to 100 and it's it just it's infinitely complex and counterintuitive and <laughs> things that people don't even completely understand yet and yeah so know. that happens with video too but much much yeah. sooner than the last hundredth percentile <laughs> yes yeah exactly well Nathaniel so I uh, yeah, thanks for that. It's been such a joy to talk to you, and it's it's been great. We we try to on this show uh, dig into the technical stuff a little bit, and it's wonderful for you to share so many details about what you do with us. Um, do you, this is I, I guess uh, we're going to wrap up the show. Do you have any other last plugs you'd like to do of things coming up? Or um, no, I'm just I'm just uh, so honored to be asked to to talk about this, and uh, you know if people are interested in something that I didn't. Cover. Uh, I've got you know my website, which is just NathanielBartlett.com, and then you can link to um, like I have uh, a Facebook that's just for my, Facebook page that's just for my music stuff, and you can link to my page. You know, there's a a Facebook stuff that's you know personal stuff. It's you know my baby and you know <laughs> me on my bike. So you know, contact me via the um, via my email contact form if you want to ask any other questions and. There's samples of all my recordings that you can you can play on your on your mobile phone or any any device, and they're all uh, available f- um, in both digital download and um, physical media format. I think that's that's about it. Yeah. Well, it's it's been wonderful to have you, Nathaniel. And like Nathaniel said, you can check out his stuff at nathanielbartlett.com or on his uh, musician Facebook page. Um, yeah. Thank thanks so much for joining us. This has been our July episode of Patch In, part of the SoundNotion.tv network. Uh, you can, uh, we're going to, so we, we went through all these news items at the beginning of the show, and we're going to have links to all of those in the show notes as well. And, and also uh, everything we talked with Nathaniel about his different pieces and the technical things that we, we talked about. I want to link to those computers. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, npcnoise.com. It's pretty neat. Or dot org, or I don't remember what it is, but it'll be in the show notes, like we said. So and, you don't uh, even have to know. Yeah, exactly. You just click on the thing, and it's going to take you right there, and it's going to be lovely. And where can so, people find those? <laughs> I'm going to keep interrupting you. <laughs> <laughs> the show notes. You can you go to soundnotion.tv slash pi, or it'll it'll be up in, at the top of the list on the regular soundnotion.tv page as well. Um, so in addition, and that's where the show notes will be. There will be a link. To the video will be in bed and a link to hear or download uh, the audio and video. Um, in addition to that, you can also subscribe to us on iTunes uh, and or whatever podcatching uh, service you like to use. Uh, you, you can also support our shows and the rest of the ones on soundnotion.tv. We've got an Amazon affiliate link on the, on the website at soundnotion.tv or we take donations. We, you can just like send us lovely things in the mail. <laughs> Any anything would be lovely. And uh, but yeah, especially thanks. one of those uh, Bowman synthesizers. Yeah, I, I would Love take to see one of those outside my door. Yeah, exactly. You know, they're they're not that bad. You could you could afford to send us something. It'd be really nice. Um, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, thank you so much. Thanks again, Nathaniel Bartlett. Um, my name's Nate Blyton. I'm Ben Furman. And and thanks again. This is Ben. A lovely patch in for the month of July. I'll see you next month.